Hello, everyone. This is Simon Cathro. Um, we're here today to for our second episode of The Cut. Um, my producer and director, Kira Yu, is behind the cameras. And we have a, uh, a another guest today, another great guest of mine, a contact of mine, uh, Adrian Loder from Allegro. Adrian's been in the um, private equity space now for, for for a long time, but he's he originated from the insolvency industry. And uh, welcome, Adrian. How are you? I'm very well, Simon. Thank you very much for having me here today. Look, um, look, we're just here to talk about just a little bit about yourself and where you came from, the industry you're in. Um, how about we just start about you know where what a bit about yourself? What, you know, where did you start? How how did your career start out? And and tell it tell us a little bit about that. Sure, Simon. So um, I graduated in 1991 from university, and at that stage, the only jobs there were were insolvency jobs. So I joined yeah, Co- Corp, um, Arthur Anderson's corporate recovery division. Yep. And I probably had about um, two years of formal insolvency work. Yep. And then I got involved in operating turnaround, which was basically cost cutting. So for about three or four years, I just did straight cost cutting, go into organizations, try to reduce their cost base. Yeah. So they're well, like the Grim Reaper coming in, to be honest. <laughs> when you, when so you start off in insolvency, you move into this, opera, what, what sort of, go, you know, tweaks your interest in this operational turnaround? Because if, if I go back to that period and I, I didn't start till 96, you know, that, that kind of stuff was quite in its infancy, I would have thought. Look, it was really in its infancy. So um, I remember my first week at Arthur Anderson, um, it, you know, below the Harbour Bridge, you have, um, you know, there, there was a big, there is a big hotel there. Yeah. Um, and um, like this was Australia in the middle of a recession without any capital in the market. I think the highest bid we had for that whole 200 metre long Wharf One yeah. was $750,000. Really? And so it was a receivership and the bank then ultimately took $1.5 million. So that massive building, which subsequently got sold, I think, like $200 million, now Australia was, you know, no money at all in it. Yeah. No no superannuation funds. It was basically fairly, fairly, fairly broke. And so, like, I did a couple of years of formal insolvency, which, to be honest, has been a great part of my background because... You know, I've always been able to understand administrations and receiverships. And I, you know, to be honest, I probably bought more companies out of administration than than probably anyone else in Australia. And, yeah, um, that's true. And then, you know, I got involved in operating operating turnaround. And that was really, you know, as I say, just going in there where a client of Arthur Anderson needed his cost base reduced. Yeah. And my job was to really go through and try to work out um, how to basically cut, um, cut out costs. Yeah. And then I think the third part of my career really happened in 1997, 98, when the Asian financial crisis occurred. And I went to Thailand to help start Arthur Anderson's financial restructuring business, Yeah, um, which was like insightful in itself. So I remember my first job in Thailand, this was like a large company which had like 30,000 sales staff. So it was a big company. And, you know, I went in there as to do a... a, a effectively investigating accountants report to work out on behalf of a banking syndicate, you know, what was going to happen and, you know, asking for the numbers and, uh, and then, you know, going to the, to the, um, to the finance department. And all I could hear when I got got closer and closer was tap, 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 getting louder and louder. And I turned around and there were like a hundred ladies kind of typing up invoices on typewriters because they had no information system. So this was a business which had borrowed effectively $500 million US and had no information system. So it was like, you know, welcome to Thailand and uh, good luck with the restructure and trying to work out how you're going to do it with all, with no information. Yeah. So this is where you think, all right, and I look at what you do today and I think the learnings I've had from you and from you know, you know, Chester as well, and it's been amazing because it just shows that there's so many different options now. But you go back there, it was would you say it was quite black and white? Like there yeah. was many, like you talk about that, you sell the hotel $750,000, $1.5 dollars and you think, well, that's a pretty good business, right? There was Not, a massive piece of land, yeah. like a massive piece of land below the hub. Yeah. Right? So you look at that asset today and you get presented with that asset today, you see some real opportunity in that asset and how it can be fixed. Yes, it's got some financial problems, but the solutions that we have today compared to what you had back in the 90s were far different. 
Um, and I, I think what I'm trying to get at is like, you know, Anderson's, you know, you know, it's a shame it, it, it failed and it disappeared off the planet. But like, it, it, I remember Anderson's always been that fifth big accounting firm in the top five the, that just was always ahead of the curve when it came to, you know, service offerings, doing things, doing things differently, almost. Um, seeing new opportunities so do you do you think your learnings and experience in anderson's was a, a real was a great experience in the sense that they did things a lot differently than the other four well i had a lot of freedom so um no i think i joined at a good time so when i when i when i joined and this may sound this this definitely ages me um you know i wasn't given a computer so i joined yeah. a firm without a computer and before email and you know i knew how to use excel and yep. no one else knew how to use Excel. Yep. PowerPoint didn't exist. Word didn't really exist. Um, certainly Anderson's didn't use Word at that kind of point in time. So, But I knew how to use Excel. Yep. And so um, I was in a very fortunate position that I, I even though my, my knowledge was fairly basic, I was basically ahead of everyone else. And I actually think, you know, from a career point of view, um, you know, everyone starts off at the same level, you know, being a staff accountant or whatever it's called now. But... Yep. Effectively, um, what happens is if you're perceived as being better or being able to add more value, you're in demand, and then you get put on better jobs, yeah. and then because then you get more experience, and then you get better jobs because you got more experience and more skills. And so, what really occurs is that you know people in exactly the same title, but some people have got way more experience and become way better than other people. Yeah, and I think. And I think that really kind of, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a long career, that actually makes a very, very big difference. Um, I think this, the, the thing which really taught me out of the whole, um, you know, firing people role, which was not fun in the slightest, yeah. was you have to add value. So I think the biggest influence it had on me was if you're in a position where you're not adding value, you know, really you are waiting to be, in a, to be kind of restructured out by someone like me when I was in my 20s. Yeah. And so, you know, I always used to think it was so unfair that you see people in their 50s who I'd be coming to talk about you know, what they did and they didn't really realise it was a job interview yeah. and then suddenly kind of I'm sitting there and they may, might be interested, maybe not interested, but, you know, if they're not interested, you know, they, you know probably they, 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 they didn't fall on the right side of that restructure. So so it was it, it, that's what it really, really taught me that you had to actually kind of go and create value and I think that was my big... Um, no, that was one of the big influences I had on my in my life yeah. because I thought I'm never going to become that person who basically goes basically gets restructured out when I'm in my fifties. So, so I, I think of the time when I started to hear the words create value, and it's a long time after you're thinking it already. So you're at Andersons, you 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 make the move, right? So you moved into private equity and quadrant, uh, not quadrant. Um, what was it again? Yeah. So my, my my career is that. So I, I went and joined my well, one of the partners in Arthur Anderson. Yeah. And so I, I think, and then eventually I, start, I set up um, Key Capital. That's it, Key Capital. That's which right. was uh, which was an advisory business, but it always wanted to become a private equity business. So again, if you kind of roll, you know, um, I met Chester in about um, 2002, 2003. And right. We, and we okay. formed... Um, key capital, and I'll call it Allegro from now on, from, from Allegro from 2004. Yeah. And and really, you know, our goal, so, so just had a private equity background. My background was in restructuring and we thought there was a real opportunity to to, to form a private equity fund focused on um, underperforming businesses um, when when really there was no market for that in Australia. So we, were, we really had a first mover advantage but- when, it, when it kind of came to that whole idea. And, but there's mar- there's markets like that around the world at the time. Uh, is yeah. this, where's the idea come from? To, yeah, to so this? so if you look at the American great um, restructuring houses, they really started in mid nineties. Yeah, um, but America had a recession, um, you know, just prior to that. And if you look at what happened in Australia, is that the last time there was a recession in Australia was the early nineties, and the private equity industry started in the mid nineties in Australia. So. All of the funds which started, they were growth orientated funds. Yeah. And so, and then the, you know, and then the more successful growth orientated funds became uh, leveraged buyout funds and larger and larger, but no one was doing distressed funds because there was no distressed market in Australia because Australia was doing very well and there was no recession. 
So when Chess and I first started and saying, well, like, we want to form a, you know, a, a turnaround private equity fund, a special situation funds, as some people call it, um, well, you know, the first thing really was, was is there even a market for distress yeah. private equity? Yeah. And, and I remember like back in, say, 2005 or so, um, I think it was the, um, I think it was called the, uh, the airport link. Yep. The airport link went into um, administration, yep. which is, and that is the, uh, the, um, the, the train line between the airport and the Sydney CBD. Yep. And I came out with, with this unique idea of let's buy the debt to control the administration and offering the banks 100 cents in the dollar if they would buy the debt, if they would sell their debt to me, and they all said no. And I remember the administrator saying at the time, Adrian, if you want to buy this asset, you have to compete in the sale process like everyone else. Banks will never sell their debt. Yeah. And so that was 2005. Yeah. And that just shows how really the Australian market was totally immature to the rest of the world, really. Yeah. And then, of course, what happened in 2008 was the great, you know, there's the recession, with the, the worldwide financial crisis. And then the hedge funds, you know, then they started raising money, these, um, to basically play stress credit across Asia. And what they really meant was Australia and Japan. And they came to Australia about 2010. And really th- through that timing, the, um, you know, the whole market started to get validated because the, uh, you know, the, you know the, the credit funds turned up. Yeah. So, you've, so, so coming back to Allegro a little bit, so you've set up this um, business um, key capital first. And then it more it changed its name to Allegro. Well, what, why did it change? Because there was a, an advisor. There was a, an advisor to private to to the funds called yeah. um, Key Key Advisors. Yeah, and they suggested that we should change our name. So we 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 accepted their suggestion. So Allegro, why is it called Allegro? What's well, your, what's the name? Where's yeah, name? well, my my wife came um came up with the idea. So she's a mu- musician. Yep. And so Allegro means fast and lively. Um, and you know, it begins with A. So we thought if there's a list, we'll always be up at the top of the list. <laughs> and um, and people who have played musical instruments, they kind of think that they've heard it before, and really they haven't heard it before. They're just remembering the fact that they used to play the play uh, the piano. So. So you know, I thought there were you know, there were there were several reasons, and and, and that's where it, was it. it came out and it was available. Yeah, no, great. And 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 so okay, your first uh, so getting into the business Allegro. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that uh, the business and and what it specialises in? And sure. So Allegro is a private equity fund. We currently have about two point six billion under management. We've got a staff of about thirty. Um, and that really comprises, you know, admin and investor relations team. Um, and we also have deal team and we also have operating partners. And the role of operating partners is to help transform businesses once we own them. So we have human capital operating partners. We have IT operating partners, people who specialize in finance. Um, we have to get some marketing on. So there's a whole range of skill sets So that once we we buy a business, we can actually help them actually uh, actively transform, mm. to become better businesses. So what Allegro really does is it, you know, it finds businesses which are underperforming and, you know, we then try to turn them into better businesses. So we have yeah. this kind of concept of you know, believing in better because ultimately when you buy a business so um, and then sell a business, there's only certain ways you can make money. One is to... Um, produce cash out of that investment. Um, the second is to improve its earnings. And the third is to improve the multiple. Um, and, the, and improving the multiple is all about having a buy universe who thinks that the business is actually better. Yeah. And so if you can do all three, which is the goal, and if you're a turnaround fund, is, um, is you know, you actually make solid returns. Yeah. And so we what, what we do is we, we seek situations where there's um, – now, active, complex transformation opportunities, and they really sit into kind of three different buckets. So the first is like corporate carve-outs. So, for instance, Toll, we just bought yeah. a Toll Global Express, yep. and Toll Global Express is part of Toll Group. It's one of three divisions, and we bought that whole division comprising 8,000-odd workers and 30-odd thousand people involved in, in, in that business, mm. including contractors. 
out of you know the toll group mothership, and that's actually you know cor- corporate carve outs are complex because you know you, they 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 generally don't come with um, a finance function, an IT function, or an HR function, and there's certain core functions which have to be rebuilt because you're buying a, a, a you know a, a division yeah. out of a out of a mothership. Yeah, and so we we specialize in those complex active transformations, yeah. corporate carve outs, especially when there's few problems with them and then the second type we do is turnarounds um so i think you know we we have a strong market position in in turnarounds and most turnarounds we probably see in australia yeah and then the third thing we do is because we've got this focus on how do we improve businesses um what we also do is partner with people in good businesses to help them help help them get better so for instance we own you know a percentage of the largest um a radiology business in West Australia, which is a really, really good business. Yeah. Really what we're trying to do is help uh, improve the doctor model and, and some of the operating effectiveness um, and, you know, ultimately kind of make them a little bit more corporatized. How many, like, I, I know how many deals you actually do, but when how many deals come across your table, say, in a, in a typical year? Probably about 150 odd. Yeah, and you'd convert on four or five or something like that, is it? Yeah, ideally you want to do about three to four. Three to four, yeah, yeah. So so for, for the typical per, uh, you know, viewer out there watching this and you're saying, right, okay, when, when's, when is the time to think about Allegro, right? So a, All the time. All the time. You should go I, to bed thinking well, about Well, I know Allegro, you say that to me, you say that to me all the time, but I mean like <laughs> – you know, I mean, you've done. I just look at the personal interaction you and I have had over the years, right? Yeah. And you've gone out of your way to educate me on, sure. on distressed private equity. And I'm almost certain you've done that to every other insolvency and restructuring practitioner in our industry, plus plus everyone else, right? Yeah. So today, I look at distressed private equity, and I, I talk amongst my network, and you know, you've spoken in front of audience of my network before, and and, and tried to teach them, and I think they're much much more familiar, right? I think. The question that I suppose we always hear is, uh, so not the question, but the things that we always hear is, I've got this great business, right? But it's in financial difficulty. And of course, you know that eight times out of 10 or nine times out of 10, the business the business isn't that great. It's just either, you know, poor management or, or just, they just got themselves into the wrong business. So what would be the sort of... Um, best way for people to say right when should i think about distressed private equity like if is there a there's probably not a simple formula but i mean yeah. is there something that you can sort of just yeah, sort of so, shed some light on yeah so the, the way which i think about it is that um like the big difference between my example in 91 to 93 when you know we we're talking about that building under Sydney Harbour Bridge yeah. is that australia now has liquidity yeah like there is there is money yeah. around the economy in fact you can find money um, and if you've got a problem, you can probably find money to solve it because there's now credit funds, there's now high net worth people who could potentially help. There's also private equity funds like us. And and you know I think the the big thing is that um, you know I'd always encourage people first of all they're going to pick up the phone and just ring and just say hey I've got a problem um, and I want to come talk talk to you because generally people will always listen to you. Um, and then I think you've got to be, you know, clear about what you actually really want. And so if I look at some of the, the main things, like if you approach anyone, like, but if let's say you, you're approaching us, it's kind of, you know, you've got to have a view about, you know, um, what is your problem and what type of industry it is. So if you approach someone who the last five de- deals is they, they, they did were property deals or property mes deals, say, and you go and approach them with an operating turnaround, my gut feel, without knowing anything about it, is they aren't going to do that deal. Yeah. So you have to find the right type of fund for what, what you know what your problem is, and then you know you have to be kind of. And this is, I think, the hardest thing for an advisor. It's um, you know the, the the hardest thing is that for a principal, like if you look at the various stakeholders involved in in a distressed deal, you have the pre, you have the current owners who probably could have sold the business two years ago for more than it's worth today and they're regretting it and but they're trying to recapture the, the equity value that they actually lost. Yeah. Then you have the banks, if there's banks involved, who just want to get 100 cents back in the dollar. And then you have someone who's new equity who's actually kind of coming in 
to actually provide a, you know a solution involving capital, but it could also involve involve skills as well. And I think the hardest thing for an advisor is to work out um, how do I basically broker the deal between those three parties yeah. so that a deal can be done. Because what 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 alternates what happens for the new money coming in is is that they're pretty honest about what they think the business is worth because they don't have yeah. any vested interests. They don't care whether the business worth three times more two years ago than today. They just look at it on today's value and says this is what this business yeah, is they're not, they're not emotionally connected. They're not emotionally connected. Yeah. So you have this kind of fear and greed thing which actually kind of happens between all of those three players, the existing um, equity owners are alternating between fear and greed every single day depending upon yeah. upon what, what they hear and then you have the, 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 the new money who's got lots of deals and opportunity happening and basically you've got to catch them while you think that yeah. you know, there is a real opportunity to actually do a deal. And so the real thing about a broker is that, sorry, as someone who wants to bring a deal to someone like, like myself is that, you know, you, you should, you should, you know, you want to kind of make the private equity fund feel like they're a bit special, that they've got an early run of this, you know, that there is a clear amount of money being required. There is, there is something there. Yeah. And then at the same time, they've got to deal with their kind of the person who's paying their bill, which is probably the equity owner yeah. to try to broker a deal. And so I always think that the real trick is you want to, you know, work on all these parties and then three in three months' time, there is when all these kind of fear and greed things align, there's going to be an opportunity to actually do a deal. So I reckon that, you know, approaching a private equity fund is relatively easy. The real thing you've got to do, though, is get their attention. Yeah. Because, um, and and I think the, and the easiest way to do that is just to have a discussion and, and like we don't expect thick documents or anything like that. They're always the first discussion can just be with one piece of paper. But ultimately the, what you're looking for out of that first discussion is how much money do you want? You know, when do you actually really want to buy? And what do you think the value of your business really mm-hmm. is? And then how can I help? And so that the how can I help points are really, really important question because now, if all you want is money and you don't want any advice whatsoever, then well, then probably Allegro is not for you. It's not for you, no, right? That's right. But if you want someone to help you build a better business and help you build something which is truly exitable to kind of create value, then someone like Allegro is actually very, very useful because you can all make money together. I, I, I think of some of the deals. I mean, Pizza Hut, right, and, and some of the other deal and, and, and deals you've done with you know, you know, the best and least group, um, and, and some of these ones. What I feel like, and maybe it's because I know you personally, but I feel like um, there's a real pivot in the strategy once you get involved, and suddenly you feel like something's happening in that business. You feel uh, you, 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 it's getting promoted better. It's 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 creating more positive noise out there. You're seeing uh, movement. So that it's almost like these businesses have been paralyzed for maybe a couple of years before you get involved. And maybe it makes, it probably makes a lot of sense given that they're, they are in some sort of financial underperformance, uh, part of their, their, their life. Right. So, uh, you know, how active do you get involved? Like, do you literally, uh, get, you know, you've got the management there and I'm sure there's underperforming many management in there that has to be dealt with. Tell me a little bit about, you know, some examples, you know, you don't have to talk about a specific business, but just the, the mindset. Once you've, you've done the deal, now, now it's time yeah. to turn around. So there are there are two parts to doing a deal. The first part is to do the actual deal, yeah. which is providing money and having rights and doing all of those good things. And, and the second part to it is what is the investment thesis behind the deal. Yeah. So, you know, before you invest – what you have to do as a private equity fund is to say, you know, my goal here is to increase uh, increase revenue by X. You know, is it rolling out 20 stores? Is it shrinking stores? Is it cutting something off? Um, I'm going to improve margin by Y. I'm going to improve my earnings like by this. And then I, I believe I can sell the business for this. And so before you go in, you have a very kind of clear investment thesis and then the role is to actually execute on the investment thesis. So this is the fundamental difference between private equity and kind of um, other types of companies. So 
as a let's call it a coffee shop. So if you, there are really three different layers, there's a shareholder, there is the um, directors, and then there is a management team. In a in a in a small family business, the shareholder, the management. Um, and the directors are all the same person. Yeah. So you can, you, there's no formal meeting. You can just kind of approach them any way you want and talk to them. So let's go to the other other end, which is kind of like um, a large Australian public public company. There you've got high speed trading. So the shareholders trade, you know, change the whole time. Um, you have an, a board which is mainly set up for independence, and then the CEO um, you know, comes up with a strategy and um, you know, presents it to the board. Gets, gets, gets changed, but, but but agreed, and then they execute on that strategy. But if they aren't happy, you know, the board's interaction with the management team is through the CEO. If they aren't happy, they change the CEO. Yeah. Private equity business, the shareholder, before you, know, before you even begin, has a clear view about how they want to make money. The role of the board is to turn that investment thesis into a strategy, mm. and then the management's team is to execute on that strategy. So you have a very a fundamentally different view about how you are creating value and it's kind of private equity sponsor or shareholder led compared to management led. And so if I look at our role on, on, in, on companies is that we have a thesis before we actually begin. Now I'm often, you now we have members on the board. We are control investors, which basically means we can control the board. Um, and, you know, as soon as we go in, we have our operating partners kind of come in to execute on part of that thesis, whatever that thesis actually really is. Um, and, and, then, and then, you know, the management team has basically been incentivized to, to really execute on that plan and then they get a cut of the upside when value is actually created. So you have a very a fundamentally different view about, about what the role of the sponsor is. So the answer to that in summary is that, someone like Allegro is highly active. Yeah. So if I look at kind of like Toll as an example, within three weeks we've done a culture survey through that whole organisation. Wow. You know, um, when, we bought Best, when we bought Pizza Hut, we rolled out a new ERP on the day we bought it. Yeah, that's true. That was, you know, yeah. So our operating partners worked mm. side by side, built a mirror system. You know, Yum, who owned the business, didn't want us to be on their ERP. We wrote a new ERP on the day we bought it. Yeah. And so, you know, and that is not, and so because that's all part of the investment thesis. Yeah. So you look at all the investments you've been making and, and the ones, uh, what, what's the, what's probably the most satisfied transaction experience you've had at Allegro that, um, that you can recall? Well, I've been involved, you know, probably because I'm, I'm a bit old now. I've been involved in a few. You're not that old, mate. So <laughs> <laughs> no, but so I can, like, my, I've been involved in Discovery Park since 2008. Yeah. And when I started there, that was probably a negative 50 million um, equity value. is probably over a billion dollars today. Yeah. Well, I know it's over a billion dollars today. So that whole transformation, that's, that's, that's been wonderful. I think um, the Garn, when we took the Garn in, in, in yep. Pacific, yeah. we turned that from um, a, a, a business which was a, uh, a transportation business and turned it into a luxury tourism business. When that's been remarkably successful, mm. and so that that was that's been enormously satisfying. Um, you know, one of the things we did is IMED Network, which is a radiology business, yep. Australia's largest radiology yep. business. We went in. Allegro went on as financial replacement financial sponsor on behalf of 30-odd hedge funds and I was interim CEO there for a while and we turned that and when we went in there, you know, there was a whole range of distressed debt, there was $900 million of debt and we really transformed that. The balance sheet got transformed and, and ultimately the business got sold and now you know, got sold very well and everyone made lots of money and then ultimately... The business is probably three times the size today as it was yeah. back in 2014 when that transaction occurred. So, so you know, there's been a number of kind of really great, great roles, and we've been fortunate to be involved in them. To be honest, and you look at those successes, the ones you just mentioned, right? How different is the culture? At the end of it, I mean, oh, clearly it's in a, in a much stronger culture than when you first came in, like. When you, you know, can you tell us a little bit about sort of the 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 the, the ride that was taken there to, to I mean, the, to, to to get to get that culture to what it was? Yeah, like uh, so. The biggest change I think through my career has been the role of technology. 
So transformation now. So if you just think about the types of transformation you can have, you can have, you know, balance sheet transformation, which is about money and making the, the, the balance sheet fit for purpose and the whole range of those things. The second is really kind of cultural transformation. Mm. And then probably the third is kind of sy- systems and, um, and operational transformation. And I think the, you know, because we, we, can, we control the board, we can put an operating rhythm through the business. We can put in, you know, change the business, um, you know, uh, through bringing in digital solutions and do a whole range of operating things, which probably wasn't there at the start. And certainly the company didn't know about it at the start. And I think one of the big advantages of having a large portfolio of company of businesses is that you can copy off each other. So you can say to one business, you need this solution. Why don't you have a look at this 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 company over here? Did the same yeah. a couple of years ago. They can see it. You can get the same advisors involved, and you know you can de-risk the you know yeah. execution of that, and you can also achieve the the outcomes that you actually really want. Yeah, so in some ways, as you do your next acquisition, you've got a whole bunch of uh, previous acquisitions that you can draw on. Say right, absolutely, okay, like, or part oh, of the investment thesis. Yeah, like you know, the, you know, the next acquisition you might make, you go, well, we did this in toll. Uh, go and have a look at toll. That's you, right. You introduce them to them, and then the, the, the sharing of knowledge is, it just becomes greater and more efficient, and so things move a lot quicker. Then, yeah, I think a private equity fund, in some ways, is like a, a modern conglomerate. In that sense, yeah, yeah. Like if you think about what happened in conglomerates, yeah, they were all the rage like 25, 30 years ago. But what happened is the conglomerates never sold any of their assets and they went up and down with the value of their assets. But a private equity fund has many businesses, but because of the structure of them, they're forced to sell their assets every kind of three to five years. Yeah. So therefore, they're always trying to value maximize and they never get that kind of agency cost of someone who thinks it's their career just to sit on the asset and basically never move it forward. So I say I think I think that's right because certainly in Allegro, yeah, I can't speak for every private equity fund, we definitely kind of roll out ideas. And our operating partners, because you know, they learn from one portfolio company, they roll out. So our time attendance, you know, we roll it out. You know, our HR management system, we roll it out. Yeah. You know, every single time we just kind of roll out, especially in this whole transition part where you buy a non-core asset out of a larger parent, it's not going to have a, you know, an HR management tool as an example. Yeah, so you've almost had to build it from scratch and, and yeah, that's so a new challenge. We have a, we have a team which just basically yeah. does it. So you know, our transition team's got 150 items on the list when they, when they buy it, say, and they've probably done 100 of them before you even buy the asset. Yeah, wow, wow. So moving on to um, going forward, okay, so... You know, we, I've known you since your, your first small acquisition and you've always been a great guidance to me and I thank you for that. But, like, um, you know, each each sort of five years, you and Chester seem to just go bigger and bigger, right? So you're starting to really get into some serious acquisitions, Toll being the prime example. Where do you see, you know, you just raised your, your latest fund and that was oversubscribed and got some fantastic publicity there and, and um, you know, you're ready to go again. Where do you sort of feel your market's going to be over the next two years? Mm. Well, I think um, first of all, we you know we are in the process of finalising our fund, and we you know we have a 700. I think we'll end up with about 700 million dollars yep. of uh, committed funds, and so that's kind of obviously a great place to be. And and to be honest, we've we broadened our investor base. We have a number of, of people who've invested in our fund. And so, you know, we're very, very thankful for their support. Um, and that's like committed 10-year money. So we're very, very excited because um, because of because of, of, of the firepower that we now have. If I look at what's really happened the last kind of probably six months is, um, you know, you have, a, you have major risk kind of coming into the market and all the portfolio companies I sit on, probably the biggest issue is... Um, is probably inflation, yeah, uh, and um, and then there is the kind of the temporary kind of COVID flood, you know, impacts which seem to happen every single month. There's a different kind of crisis occurring somewhere in the business, but I think that's actually more temporary. But if but the you know it's the it's the um, the change of behaviours um, caused by work from home 
or work from anywhere. And I think inflation are probably the two biggest drivers that we're actually seeing. And the one which I'm most worried about is, in fact, inflation and its effects because not only is inflation going to affect the, um, you know, the cost of things, no, it affects people's discretionary income. You know, if you look at what's happening right now as petrol prices are going yeah. up and, you know, if they just have the scheduled kind of increases in interest rates, uh, over New South Wales home has circa $800,000 of debt, you know, that's like $700 a month taken out of the average family. Um, you know, electricity is going up and all of those things, that's another $700. Petrol's going up, or that another $500. So you're suddenly taking out per month, you know, a couple of grand, mm. um, and that's going to have a very, very big effect, I think, on people's discretionary spend, spend yeah. as well as their confidence in spending on larger assets as well and asset purchases. Um, so you can see a, you know, a variety of issues happening there. Now, if I put my toll hat on, you know, and look at what's happening out, out there in distribution land and, you know, logistics is harder, um, you know, there's, you know, lots of increased costs there and things are becoming, you know, slower to kind of come in. And I think if you look at supply chains, they're all like majorly is kind of slowing down. And then you see what the, the, the Prime Minister is saying, which is, you know, the whole just in time is kind of over. You know, we're going to start to, you know, we want Australia to be more self-sufficient, which is probably going to add more cost and probably more cash required on your inventory, you know, invested in inventory and things like that. So I think we actually are in the start of a change and I think I think there are certain winners out of that. So I, I perceive the last kind of couple of years as that there's been definite winners in the economy in terms of sectors which have yeah. won out of it. Yeah, And then sure. I think and there's, and there's uh, I think from, from Australians' point of view, there's people who've won. There's people who have lost as well, and there's companies which have lost. And I think so. I think there's going to be increased turbulence kind of going forward, especially for the people who've lost, as well as the companies which have lost, which I think is has probably not been really seen since the early 90s, I think, in Australia. I mean, change management is a term we use, but I mean, change, permanent changes that happen to us as individuals in, in the work environment and what we do in our lives. I mean, I can't recall a period of time, certainly for me in the last couple of years, that I, in my whole life that I, I haven't changed as much as what I've had to change in the last couple of years. But I somehow feel like the next 12 months is going to be the game changer like for, 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 for us as individuals because it will almost set potentially in the next 10, 15 years of where the economy is going, what the economy is going to look like. We've done, we've had this fundamental change forced upon us and it's, it's created all these things you know we've had the quantum leap on um on technology you know because of, you know we had to right and now people are just sticking with it you know i'm finding there's a significant change just within in my own business with the way staff are delivering and the, the way the staff are wanting to work what worries me a bit about inflation is that it, it, you just don't know how high it's going to go because you talk about you know, January was on record. The floods were February. You know, what's March going to be? Like it's it's like, okay, you've got this constant almost, it's not a disaster but an event that happens that is having an economic impact on, on a much greater scale than ever before, right? So, so when you look at those kind of things and, and you go, right, okay, I've just got a $700 million fund and this is the way I've, you know, we, we've successfully set up Allegro uh, over the last 15 years. And, and now, you know, I, for me, I, I look at your business and how it's known out in the business and it's, you know, people, you're, you're a, I'm not saying you're mature, but I'm saying you're, you're the, the knowledge of distressed private equity is, 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 is much more mature than when it first started where it was very unknown in Australia. Do you, what do you think it's going to be for your business in trying to find the opportunities, keeping in mind that your thoughts around inflation? Like, can you, is it much more unpredictable now than what it was in the past? Or? No, I think it's actually, uh, from my point of view, what that'll all lead to is a strategy shift by larger corporates. No, no. Historically, when you have a benign environment, yeah, people may think they've got an unloved subsidiary, but are they going to do something about it? And I think really, you know, now you have a number of boards which are really just saying, "Well, do I actually really want to be in this asset?" 
And if I don't sell now, what I, what's going to happen? And they've got other pressures on their business, which may kind of lead them to actually make, yeah. make a decision. So more carve outs, more carve out type work. I think there'll be more carve outs, but I think there's just going to be more decisions made. And I think interesting decisions actually lead to um, you know to opportunity. Yeah, uh, whether it's growth opportunity or turnaround opportunity. So I actually think from a deal point of view, I think it's going to be very strong. And I think the hardest thing though is actually going to be the buy sell spread, because especially in kind of performing businesses, because you know, businesses which won out of COVID, they're going to say that's the new norm. Mm. And everyone who lost out of COVID and they got to sell, say, look, normalize that out. And but but so, that's, and that's so, not right, is it? I mean, but that's, no, that's, that's not right. That's the market though, right? Yeah, at the moment people are saying that, but generally speaking there is a bunch of businesses in that, have, that are going to be normalized in the next six months because they've had this sort of nice ride during COVID. I mean, surely that's... But it's buy-sell spread, right? Because, uh, yeah. you know... If people have got different expectations on value, that's yeah. that's where I think. So I think at the moment there is a record number of kind of M and A transactions out there. I think the big issue is going to be: are they going to be completed? Yeah, because of the buy sell spread. Yeah, and um, and so I think that that in itself is going to provide opportunity as well. If I'm being honest, because you know, what are people going to do? Yeah. Look, just to just to, just on a final point. Um, What's the key takeaway uh, that our you know the people watching this podcast should should think when it, we're you know going forward for, from a from a, a leg grade private equity perspective that sort of they should should think about? I, I, well, from a leg grade point of view, I think if you if you want a partner who can add value and you need capital, think of Allegro. Yeah. I think, and we're very we're very approachable. And we'll certainly give you an honest view about where, where we think, you know, you are. And to be honest, always getting a, an independent view is always is always useful, even if you kind of go somewhere else and decide to do something else, um, because at least you've kind of got a, you know, you know, you have a view. I think, I think where we're especially good is actually partnering. So if I look at all the deals we do, we generally partner with people. Yep. So partnering is like a core part of our philosophy and we genuinely look to add value in helping kind of create value through improving the underlying performance of businesses. So, you know, I look at us as being someone who wants to do those kind of deals. I think we, we've worked across a number of different industries. We've worked in like lots and lots. And so we don't really have any kind of industry prohibitions, really. Um, and you know, we're always keen to have a to have a discussion. Right. So, um, so, uh, so, so, but I think from an advisor point of view, as I said earlier, like the, the key thing is have it play the game out a couple of months ahead and try to work out what you actually think you really want. And I think that's what's always the hardest thing because normally the fact pattern is uncertain. And so even if you kind of come and say to people like ourselves, hey, I've potentially got a deal, it's roughly this size, don't know too much more than that, what do you think? Now, yeah. so in this kind of industry, they know you'll probably get a general read about are they interested or not interested or or, or where. And, and I, think there's, I think the other real interesting question when you actually approach someone like us and they say no, always ask the reason why. Yeah. Because when you understand the reasons why, Next person you approach, you should always kind of adopt whatever those reasons are and see if you actually got a solution for that because I think it actually really makes the fundraising like a, um, a lot better. Yeah. Well, Adrian, thank you. Thanks for taking the time out to to, to, to be part of the cut and uh, our podcast. And um, um, yeah, this is our second episode of the first series and hopefully it's going to be a long, um, you know, multiple se- uh, seasons, but, um, look, my name's Simon Cathro. I'm from Cathro and Partners. We're a restructuring and insolvency firm. And, um, this is a, uh, the episode talking about insolvency and restructuring and turnaround personalities. And thank you very much, Adrian. Thanks for joining us. And, uh, and, uh, we will see you soon. Thank you very much, Simon.